Hey guys, I'm Ava, and let's talk about Pokemon. Today's topic is something that is very near and dear to my heart. We're going to be talking about the fire movement and in relation to trading cards, because my channel is, of course, a lot about investing or speculating, if you will, in trading cards. So I wanted to discuss whether or not this could fit into that movement. Before I get into this, I do want to say that this is not financial or investment advice. Of course, you already know that this is just for informational and entertainment purposes only, but I think this will be a really fun video. Uh, there's definitely a lot to cover here, so I'm not going to be able to go over everything in detail because there's so much. This could be a three hour video, but I'm going to try and be as concise as I can. So first, I want to start with an explanation of fire because everyone watching might not necessarily know. So first up, fire stands for financial independence, retire early. So basically the people who are followers of this um, kind of mindset are people who want to be able to be financially independent. That's the more important part for a lot of people, not just the retiring early. Financial independence effectively means that you have the money and specifically passive income that you don't need to work anymore to maintain your lifestyle and to survive basically. So it revolves a lot around investing and saving. The people who do this save a lot of money, upwards of 50%, and this is something that I've been interested in a long time and make a lot of my life decisions based around, so it's something I care about a lot. If you're interested in learning more about this, I am going to have some links in the description to some articles explaining all the topics in this video, and also I would recommend this podcast uh, by The Mad Scientist, which is the Financial Independence Podcast. It's a really great resource, and it's just a nice listen when you're doing anything else. It's not super intensive, but it's really enjoyable to listen to. It's a lot of anecdotal experience. And I just want to kind of elaborate what financial independence can mean, even if you're not retiring. It gives you a safety net to do anything you want, really, which I think is so powerful. And it really eliminates that fear, and it's all about being fiscally responsible, which is something I think is really important, and especially in schools, isn't talked about enough at all. Think about it. You could go travel the world if you wanted to. You could pursue some sort of business idea that you have no idea if it will succeed, and you don't have to worry about generating income in the short or long term. And a lot of it is about self-determination, you know, getting out of the rat race, that type of thing. Um, not sure if everyone here believes in that, but I think that it is really, really a powerful idea and something that I aspire to personally. So next up, I'm just going to explain it a bit more, kind of how it works. So there are two types of fire mainly, which is lean fire. This is basically people who want to live a minimalist lifestyle and they don't need a lot of money to get by. They can spend maybe 25000 or less per year. Uh, oftentimes this is going to be in like more rural areas that these people will live or maybe they will um, travel to Asia, that type of thing where you can kind of get by pretty cheaply. And so this requires uh, avoiding lifestyle creep. Lifestyle creep is where your expenses rise as your income rises. So this could be due to a keep up with the Joneses mentality or just spending more because you have more to spend. And then fat fire is for people who want to achieve uh, financial independence but want to maintain their current lifestyle without having to make any sacrifices. I use that word in quotations because what's a sacrifice to someone definitely isn't to another person. So when I say living expenses very wildly, I mean it can range from, you know, 50000 in some people's mind up to like, you know, a million dollars uh, on the very, very high end. And then Barista Fire, I just wanted to have a note in here, is kind of an in-between um, where you have the money to retire, but you continue a job, which is usually part-time, purely for some additional income um, or health insurance, which is really important to most people. And then, so the way that people determine whether or not they have enough money to retire is by the 4% rule. So basically you are able to spend 4% of your nest egg and you can increase this accounting for inflation every single year. I've done the math here. So for example, if you want to live off of $25,000 a year, you'd need $625,000 saved. This isn't a crazy number for a lot of people. I mean, it is of course really a luxury to be able to um, achieve financial independence. But, you know, there are a lot of stories of people who are school teachers and whatnot being able to do this, which I think is something really amazing. Um, Fat Fire, let's say you want $100,000, you need $2.5 million. This is a lot more expensive, so this is going to be a lot of people who have higher income jobs going for this type of a goal. 
But then I want to talk about the 4% rule a little bit more because it is contested more and more. Some people think that it is too aggressive of a withdrawal rate because you would have to withdraw that money or you would have to be receiving dividends. And dividends are not technically necessarily uh, selling your stocks or assets. However, it does take away from reinvestment because when a company issues dividends, they're basically giving away um, some of their profits that's not being reinvested. So it is some sort of sale. It's kind of a forced sell unless you're auto reinvesting them, which if you don't need the money, I would definitely recommend you do. And I just wanted to show you here, I kind of have an illustration to show you the risks of the 4% rule. So I moved myself up to the upper left just so you guys could see this table, but this is the worst case scenario, um, or I guess it could be even worse, these could all be red. But so this is basically, I retire today, the market crashes tomorrow, and I immediately, or you know, over the course of the year or whatever, see a 10% drop, and it's a prolonged period. This isn't just, you know, a minor recession that is just a few quarters. That is pretty normal, and this is a more severe recession. So this is gonna be, you know, very possible, um, but we still have to withdraw our 4%, so that's $72,000 in this case. Um, and that's going to be 72,000 of our 1.8 million that we currently have left. So then we're going to only be left with 1.728 million. So then we have to keep withdrawing. We have to keep withdrawing, but our nest egg is continuing to go down because we're seeing negative returns. So we have to decrease the amount that we are spending, but we are still losing money in our nest egg. But you can see here um, in the latter half, in normal period, we would be appreciating because um, typically the market averages above 4% return, but that's over time, that's not all the time. The periods kind of are very different. You can see a negative return or a positive return that's definitely gonna be higher than 4%. So you can see though that we have to continue spending money as we lose money and the 4% decreases. If you were to keep your spending the same at like your, you know, your goal was clearly $75,000. If you kept spending that, you would have lost a lot more than this even. But here you're down to 54,000 um, and then things start to turn around in year four and you save a little bit more and you slowly go back up, but your spending, you know, has not returned to the same level. It was still about $18,000, $17,000 um, less than what you were hoping for and you've cut the value of your nest egg by nearly a third. So that's just kind of an illustration to show why the 4% rule might be a little bit risky and why some people prefer to use a 3% rule. Um, and I have here the values that you would have to have saved for that. And you can see that it requires a bit more saving. So just bear that in mind. And again, this is a complicated topic that a lot of people disagree on, but hopefully, you know, this is helpful for you. And that's 10 years later. So consider 10 years of inflation. This is shrinking a lot in terms of real money. And also just to note that most people who do this do so in tax shielded accounts, which are mainly IRAs, Roth IRAs, 401ks. If you're in a different country, you know, whatever tax shielded accounts apply to you because it kind of automatically increases the percent of your returns because you don't have to pay taxes, which is kind of one of the best investments you can make. So first, which is kind of one of the best financial decisions you can make because it makes it so much easier uh, to profit. So talking about trading cards, this is really, really complicated and um, hard to distill into this one video and this one slide, but they are clearly, clearly a high risk, high reward item. They don't have intrinsic value. Everything is subjective. So, you know, if you're looking at this from a value investing perspective, you can find value um, depending on how you look at it, but objectively, these are only worth what someone is willing to pay. They are not generating income. They are not creating a product unless you consider happiness a product, but that is a lot of risk to take. And the potential to get good returns, you know, you can get that, you, it's pretty high, but even more than traditional investments, these do not increase linearly. Here I have just shown a couple of examples. I would love to show sealed product, but it's harder to get more accurate data going back further on those but these same topics do apply that things don't increase linearly. So here you can see this is a base set Charizard. Uh, this is the unlimited version because I think this is a very common chase card for a lot of people. This card trades hands very, very often. So I think that this is a good illustrator. You can see the 10, not nearly as much as the nine and whatnot, but you can see that it has not increased linearly at all. I think the nine here is gonna be a good illustration because it doesn't have quite as many of those outliers. 
but you can see so this would have been the end of 2020 it spiked up an insane amount and if you were someone who bought it here for around five thousand dollars you would still be out about three thousand dollars which is pretty insane and there's an opportunity cost associated with that as well because you have that five thousand dollars tied up in that card when you could have invested in other things that could be making you money so then a more modern card here is the hidden fates charizard gx this is also an hm10 this data is also from pokeprice.io i think it's a really great resource uh, i used to use pokemonprice.com a lot but i think that this one has just proven to be a bit more useful and they have started doing sealed product which is very appreciated and they also do raw cards which is quite amazing so this card you know, it's worth a lot of money in a PSA 10 or a PSA 9 or even ungraded. But the thing you'll notice, when it first came out, it was about $1,300. And then it rapidly declined. And then it went back up to an all-time high here. And now it is currently sitting at a price lower than when it first came out. And this doesn't just go for graded because you could argue that the population increases a lot. It goes for raw too because more and more are being pulled. So this applies whether you're talking about graded or raw cards. And these are higher end cards and with you know more mid-range cards, it can vary um, potentially even more. But this wax and wane can be very, very stressful for people and it can trigger a lot of people to sell their cards or make not you know rational um, objective decisions, which is very understandable because Trading cards are a hobby item. There are a lot of emotions associated with them. Most of us are collecting these because we love them as children. And also when you're thinking about investing in them, you have to be willing to sell them. You know, if you have personal attachments, you might not be willing to sell them when, you know, the time is objectively right um, and or you need to. So those things should all really be kept in mind when talking about trading cards. This, talking about this risk could be, you know, a really really long video but I can't go into everything here um, so I just wanted to talk about this quickly hopefully you get the gist of this there are a lot of videos online that talk about this more so I would really recommend checking this out there are a lot of channels that talk about these things we're just highlighting this because it has to be talked about in this video because the risks are very important so now we're gonna be talking about external risks so without even thinking about within the Pokemon market you can step back and there are much more risks aside from that. So this depends on the continued popularity of the Pokemon franchise. This is the big one. Think about it. You want to live 30, 40, 50 years after you retire, right? You're, or after you reach financial independence, you're going to be depending on this money for that long. Do you think Pokemon will be popular in 50 years? I don't know. You don't know. A thousand years from now, it's probably not going to be. So at some point, it's going to stop being popular. So you should keep that in mind. Um, definitely be willing to sell if you think that the popularity starts to wane. But of course, again, this is a hobby that waxes and wanes, so you really have to be mindful and really kind of, you know, have your fingers on the pulse of the market. And again, another thing this depends on is Nintendo, which is a publicly traded company in Japan. And we're talking about this because Nintendo, you know, it is a company that is doing very, very well. However, that is not necessarily always going to be true. You have to think about macroeconomic factors. And again, these aren't just things that affect the US, it's also Japan. Here, this is around the 2008-2009 um, recession. This is their income statement. I'm going to have their financial um, investor relations page linked down below. So if you want to check any of these out, uh, I had to cut it because it's too long to fit on the screen otherwise. But you can see here that in fiscal year 2010, keep in mind that their fiscal year ended in around March of 2010. So this is actually mostly 2009. You can see that there was a massive drop in their revenue here. So this is their net sales. So this is the total value of everything they sold basically before any costs and you can see it continued to drop so this could be due to a variety of reasons of course Japan is not the US so they were affected a bit differently and also consumer spending habits can change from you know things like recessions and whatnot which is something important to keep in mind because these are a luxury item and then when we go down to net income you can see that they decreased a lot um here it's <laughs> decreased an insane amount, which is 77,000. This is a much more um, drastic decrease than looking at revenue. When you think about a company like Nintendo, they have cost of sales, which is COGS, um, which is another way to call it. Um, but that is much more variable depending on the amount of units sold. But there are a lot of things that are kind of fixed costs, unless you're laying off a lot of employees, for example, those are going to be fixed costs. You can see <clears throat> 
SGNA is a relatively fixed cost. So when you see a decrease in income, your net income is going to decrease much more. So that's something important to keep in mind. Talking about the financial statements of a company, again, this could be a very, 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 very long video. A lot of people go to school just for this, um, but I just wanted to quickly illustrate this. You, Nintendo's doing a lot better now, so that's great. But again, this could happen again. Nintendo is not recession-proof. Pokemon is not recession-proof just because they did well in the 2020 recession. This has to do with kind of the specific situation that we were in in 2020. So what I mean is that that was not really even a full-on recession because it was not really a sustained period with a decline um, in, re in GDP or anything like that. The market crashed, but it recovered very, very quickly. So um, a recession is a bit more extreme than that. Again, it's also sustained. So this was not that at all. And the reason it was also so different is that it was a very much an anomaly. So let me explain a bit more. The people most impacted were blue collar workers who were people who would have to go into work. A lot of white collar workers who are higher income people who would be buying um, these higher end collectibles were still able to work remotely. Um, if anything, a lot of their living expenses went down because they might not have been going out to eat. They didn't have to commute, blah, blah, blah. So the people buying this kind of had more power, especially because of stimulus money being given out. So stimulus money is the closest thing to helicopter money, which is normally like more of a theoretical thing, but it's very similar to that, which is where the government basically throws a lot of money out there to stimulate consumer demand pretty much immediately, which it did, which is very effective. But it also made this situation very different from most recessions because the people who would be buying these things had more power and the people who needed to be selling them needed to sell them more quickly. So, for example, a blue collar worker loses his job, but he needs some money. So he sells his collection. There are going to be a lot more buyers out there clamoring to buy it. And of course, people are sitting at home. So they're thinking more um, about hobbies. Obvious why Pokemon did well in 2020, despite, you know, that rapid uh, drop in the market. That is not a precedent that we should be looking at as reliable. That is, I would say, an outlier. You can see here, Pokemon is not Nintendo. This is not just Pokemon, but it's their, usually their number one seller. I think I was looking at it and said black and white was their number one seller when it came out. And the cards are closely linked to the success of those. And you can see that their net sales went down, which presumably means the units sold went down. And I would guess that the trading cards are correlated with the games. So please bear that in mind. Again, this is a really, really complicated topic. Um, so don't come for me if I didn't talk about everything you want me to talk about. I'm going to make a whole nother video actually about the 2020 um, situation with Pokemon. So here are some more differences I want to talk about that are ignoring risk that you have to bear in mind when you want to think about having a portfolio with um, both traditional investments and trading cards. I say both because you should not just have trading cards. Let me emphasize that. Don't just buy trading cards. So here, um, I just want to talk about like trading cards aren't actually passive. The whole point of FIRE, this financial independence, is that you have passive income. A lot of people who do this, though, are things like landlords because they have rent, but that's not entirely passive either. You have to deal with those things, right? So, you know, depending on who you are and your willingness um, to continue to put a little bit of time into your income, you know, this I think is still a very valid option for you. But also, you know, there are some really, really great options you can do passively. So you can open up your Roth IRA or your standard IRA or your 401k if you have one and just throw money into it reliably, consistently every month, which is going to help minimize risk from, you know, as opposed to putting it all in at once when you decide to retire that's a bit more risky you can see that both of these have done very very well you can see that this here is the spider snp etf so this has done very very well this is since about 2000 it's appreciated 311 percent which is very good and then here is berkshire hathaway so berkshire hathaway is an actively managed fund and then spider is a passive one because it's just an index fund you can see they've both done very well a lot of people actually say that index funds typically will outperform active managers but that's not always going to be true of course um so either of these though i think are a good option and you can have a balanced portfolio and there are a lot of other investment types stock picking 
cleaning is a lot riskier, so I would keep that in mind. Um, you really have to know a lot about that type of thing. Another difference is that trading cards are illiquid. So you have to sell and you have to physically ship cards. So that can take time. And also if you need money, you know, immediately for whatever reason, it could be a health thing. It could just be, you know, some purchase you really want to make, you want to buy a house. You can't immediately convert cards to cash, especially if you need a lot of money, right? So you should bear that in mind that this definitely should not be your sole source of income once you um, achieve financial independence, if that is your goal. And again, this requires an entirely different body of knowledge, which requires a big time investment. You need to know a lot about trading cards. That said, you know, if you're watching this video, you probably already know a decent amount, but you also need to know, you know, the card market um, and you do need to know some investing fundamentals. So you have to have that knowledge for investing kind of as a foundation. And then on top of that, you need to know um, about trading cards and you kind of have to continuously monitor it. So there are people who have done well without this though. We don't wanna be entirely gambling with our nest egg, although there is risk, right? Anyone can buy an ETF in a tax shielded account and do well um, over time in the long run. Obviously there are short term things that could lead to a negative return. But in the long run, it has shown that the stock market will typically average around a 7 to 8% return. And to do that, you don't need any background knowledge, really. Um, you just need to be willing to save money, which is really, really important for all of this. If you don't have the money to save or able to, it's hard to apply any of this, practically speaking. So save some money. So again, this requires a lot of time. You have to find the best prices when you're buying things, which is not always gonna be quick, especially if you are looking at singles as opposed to sealed product. And you need to be discerning, especially online. And also, you know, eBay auctions might be a better bet, but you have to be waiting around and constantly alert for those things. You have to be really mindful of the condition of cards you're buying or if sealed things are authentic. It's very, very easily, it's very, very easy to be fooled um, if you don't know exactly what you're looking at and even if you do. So some other just quick things I wanna talk about are space restrictions and, you know, I'm talking about in your house, like my closet is full of trading cards. Not everyone wants that. And like, if you live in a big city, you know, you might not have that much space if you are in an apartment. And another big one is gonna be price inconsistency. So you can see here that I searched um, first edition fossil packs. I can't remember, I think I searched heavy, but I might've searched light. But either way, whichever one, you can see that these don't match. They might not all be perfect matches for my search, but even within the span of less than a month, you can see that there is a lot of price variation. So again, when you're selling, you really have to know what you're selling and you have to know the best way to sell what you're selling. And keep in mind, there are a lot of fees, eBay fees, shipping fees, all of that do cut into what you would take home. So now, <laughs> I love this graphic. <laughs> so now I do want to talk about some advantages to trading cards. The biggest one I think is that if this is something you'd already be spending on, if this is your hobby, this can be a way to help you make wiser decisions. So viewing it from a perspective of a potential investment or speculation, um, if you want to be more cautious with your phrasing, when I say investment, I mean that because when I say investment, I use that because it is the most easily understood word for what we're talking about. You are buying these things um, with the hopes for a potential return. You should be mindful though that you know you might not get that return. So are you really willing to spend your money on these items even if you don't get the return? You should only really, I think, buy items that you like unless you're doing this as a business. If this is just a hobby, you should focus on things that you really enjoy. Um, Another thing I will say is that this can help keep your traditional investments more rational. I know a lot of people um, are tempted to buy meme stocks <laughs> options um, or just kind of buy companies um, and stock pick without really, really, really looking at the financials of a company and the fundamentals to figure out whether it's over or undervalued, which is very important. If you don't do that, you're almost certainly not going to outperform. Um, for me, when I am buying trading cards, it's kind of a way for me to have my fun money, my fun investing, if you will. And it's very easy for me to um, keep my main portfolio very tidy, you know, not making a lot of rash purchases, um, kind of set it and forget it, which is what I like to do. So again, I will say if you're watching this video, you probably are knowledgeable about cards already, which gives you um, a great starting place when we're talking about buying trading cards, hoping for a return. So I think that is something to bear in mind. And again, 
passion I think is the most important thing about this if you are passionate about this you are willing to keep going you know hunt for deals you're probably hopefully gonna be in it for a long haul that's again something to keep in mind if you were out of the hobby how long have you been back in it for you know do you think this interest will continue 10 years from now is really really important um, but it's basically what's gonna be kind of you know your motivating factor it's something that you enjoy doing which is really really important for this it should be something you enjoy doing because it requires a lot of time and again, if financial independence is your goal, this can be a great way to spend free time, um, you know, before and after. It's a productive activity you can do. Um, I think it's really fun and, you know, it's something I like to do now and I think it's something I will continue to do after I uh, hit financial independence. So then the next question, you know, I really want to ask you guys is like, does this make you happy? Does it add to your life? And then most importantly, maybe, would you buy these things if you didn't get the return you were expecting? So that last question is really important. Um, I think it's a really good barometer to see whether or not this is something you really enjoy doing or if it's something that you're doing purely to get money. If you're doing this purely to get money, there are um, definitely better ways to do so than just trading cards, especially if you are doing this as a hobby. You know, you don't have the capacity of a storefront. And the last point is that the whole point of FIRE and this is to improve your quality of life. And if this is adding stress and not improving the quality of your life, you shouldn't be doing it. So over here, I have a nice little graphic about um, quality of life. And you can see that there are a lot of things that relate material living conditions. That's kind of financial independence and economic and physical safety go along with that. But then there's also, you know, leisure and social interactions productive or main activity, you know, overall experience of life and like your hobbies and whatnot. So these should all be things to kind of work together to improve your quality of life the most. Uh, I think this is a really cute graphic, so I enjoy it for that reason. And then I just wanted to quickly talk about my personal experience, even though I know nobody cares, so I'm including this at the end. If you do like this video, though, you should subscribe to my channel. I put a lot of time into these videos and hopefully it shows. I'm not sure. So first, uh, this is a hobby for me, not a business. I can only look at it from the perspective of a hobbyist. So, you know, there are certain things I definitely don't know about. I don't know about working with distributors and all of that. So I cannot attest to that. And when I look at um, my collection, I don't just see, you know, dollar signs. I see a lot of cards I love. I have some cards that I posted on my Instagram over here, um, even though I don't really like Instagram that much. But my profession also kind of revolves around investing, um, so it's something that I never get tired of and, you know, it's something I could talk about or think about all day. And so for me, this is a way to combine two things I love and kind of uh, a third thing is also I love hunting for good deals. That's something that's been true about me ever since I was really, really young. And another thing that I think is maybe a best practice is to not include my trading cards in my net worth, at least when we're talking about liquid assets. So that's cash and equivalents because I don't view them as such. And also this kind of makes me work a bit harder and save a bit more because I am not including them in that. So every time I you know, spend money on cards, I do still keep in mind my investing goals and I have like minimum amounts that I want to save and I still have to hit that. So when I spend money on trading cards, I end up spending less money on other things that, you know, are maybe a bit more frivolous, won't have returns, which are like clothes, going out to eat, though, of course, you know, experiences um, that are enjoyable are important. But my goal was before I graduate college, I want to save at least $50,000 and my stretch goal was $100,000. I'm very lucky to have um, financial aid, a scholarship. So I'm very, very fortunate in that position, I know. Um, but when I am going towards that goal, I'm not including trading cards. So when I buy things, it makes me have to work harder. Um, and it's been very, very motivating for me, actually. So it's helped me save a lot of money because, you know, these cards are things that I could sell. And I do know that. Um, so I kind of have more money than I'm really mentally counting myself for. So I think that is a good way to trick your brain into saving a bit more money. And again, this is something that I could never have as a kid. I didn't have a lot of money growing up, but now I'm able to have all of these, you know, really cool cards. Um, and it's really just a lot of wish fulfillment of when I was a kid. And again, this is a hobby and it's something I enjoy. Um, and I think that nostalgia factor is really, really important for me personally. And, you know, it's what's kept me going since I was like four years old. And talking about investing goals, um, trading cards should again only be a small percentage of what you are saving. Uh, they should not be a large percentage. So when people talk about portfolios, um, a lot of times there will be 
assets with different risk levels and it's kind of a pie and different ones make up different percentages of it depending on your risk tolerance. I'm 21, uh, I have a lot of room. If you were, you know, 60, you don't have the same risk tolerance. At least you, you probably don't. <laughs> So I have a higher risk tolerance than more people so I can spend a bit more but that said it's not nearly the majority of my um, savings um, or investments at all. And then again see you know maybe dip your toes in the water try selling some cards and see if it's for you you know you do have to have the supplies for that it's some time you have to list things. Um, it can be a bit of a hassle. Um, sometimes you have to deal with annoying people, but overall, I don't think it's too bad. So I've sold, you know, not an insane amount, but I've sold like a few hundred cards before over the years. Um, and I would say it's definitely worth it. I personally don't really sell cards that are under, you know, a certain amount of money, like, um, you know, under $20 or whatever, unless I'm doing like a lot of cards, uh, just because, you know, this is a hobby again. I don't have that much time. This isn't my profession. Um, and again, when you're doing this, I think a way that will help keep you going is to buy certain things that are mostly for enjoyment um, and then others that are more investments or speculations. So you can see um, behind me, I have a lot of things that I really like and I want to be able to look at every day. And when I'm buying these, mostly the singles especially, um, it's more for enjoyment. Of course, I'm not going to be buying things that I think are overpriced or are really likely to decline in value significantly, but these aren't the things that I'm going to be investing on. Um, you know, but these aren't the things I'm going to be spending most of my, you know, trading card budget on. Um, and then things that, you know, are more investments or speculations. Things can be both. They can be enjoyment and investments. Um, but certain things, you know, kind of fall more towards one side. So if you're buying a case of a booster box, that's probably more for investments unless you want to display a cardboard box. Um, they don't look that good. It's one thing to buy the one booster box um, and have it out, but you know, I think you can see the distinction there. Um, and again, you know, I think I'm in this for the long haul because I've been collecting cards uh, since I was four. Um, I didn't just get back into this recently. You know, I was into it in middle school and high school as well. Um, and again, fire is important to me, so that's kind of part of why um, this is something I'm so interested in. Um, personal finance is really important to me, and so is saving a lot of money because I personally don't ever want to be in a situation where I really, really have to be concerned about money ever again. Um, so that's kind of why, you know, I make a lot of my life choices and that's why this is something that I enjoy so much. So hopefully this video has been helpful for you guys and if there's only one thing you can take away, I really hope it's that you just save some money. It's really, really important. Saving money is, you know, the prerequisite for doing any of the things I talked about in this video. And of course, everyone's restrictions are different. You might only be able to save, you know, 10% of your income, 5%. I would just say to save as aggressively as you as an individual can. That is my number one recommendation to you guys. There are definitely things in this video I wanna elaborate on more. I hope you guys have enjoyed this though. A huge shout out to my patrons, especially the Swanner in my life. They make this video possible. If you guys enjoy my content, please uh, consider joining my Patreon. And I do have um, eBay and Amazon affiliate links. If you guys want to support me, um, but you know, you don't have a lot of money to spare, but you are shopping on eBay or Amazon anyway, those will be in a pinned comment. It doesn't cost you anything, but I get a bit of a finder's fee, if you will, for directing the traffic. And I would really, really appreciate that. So again, please subscribe um, if you enjoyed this video and give it a like and comment below um, whether or not fire is something you're interested in, if it's one of your personal goals, or if not, why not? Um, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you guys next time.